Okay, um, in this one I'm going to talk about how you can post-process or look at your results from NASTRAN. So when we were doing beams and whatnot, it wasn't, it wasn't too big of an issue in that the data was small enough to look directly at an FO6 file. Um, as you have more elements and more data, looking in the FO6 file is going to be kind of tedious. So you want to use like a graphic uh, post-processor visualizer, whatever you want to call it, to, to look at your results. Now I'm going to show you how to use Hyperview. That is the, the full-blown post-processor um, from Altair. You can do some post-processing in Hyper Mesh, but I think Hyperview really is quite nice, and so I'm going to talk about that. Now, again, we're talking primarily about using NASTRAN. So, um, there's two types of output files that NASTRAN can operate. Actually, there's really three. Um, one is what's called a punch file, which is actually an ASCII file. Another one is an OB2 file, which is a binary file. That means it's like uh, ones and zeros. You can't really read it in an editor. It's much more compact than an ASCII file, so it saves a lot of space. And then the third one is an XDB file. Uh, to do the punch or the um, ODB file, you have to, um, not ODB file, it's obvious, the, the DB, the OP2 file, um, you have to actually bring it into HyperMesh and then run a processor on it to write a results file. That's actually the Altair Optistruct format, and then read that. So it's actually two steps. I think it's easier just to directly read in the .xdb file. So the first thing you have to do, so I'm going to show that approach. Uh, if you want to know about punch files and uh, OPT files, just let me know, and I'll talk to you separately about that. But I think the, the easiest way is to do the xdb. So the first thing you have to do with the XDB is actually tell NASTRAN to write the XDB file. And it's kind of weird. Um, you know, we still have all this data here that's being written out through the subcase statement. Okay? The displacements, the element forces, the SPC forces, and the element stresses and strains. Okay? But in the bulk section, if you put uh, the first one of these parameter cards, so the first field is param, the second field is post, I think it can be uppercase or lowercase, it doesn't matter, and in the third field you put a zero, at, um, NASTRAN will write the xdb file when it executes. Okay, So you just have to open up the BDF file and type this in, or probably, there, I'm sure there's a way you can get HyperMesh to put it in through one of the unsupported cards features, okay? All right, so we've edited this, and I've already run this, so I already have um, the XDB file, okay? So let me start HyperView, all right? It's going to be under Altair. Altair HyperWorks. And here's HyperView. So it'll load up in a second. The first thing it'll do is this screen that lets you pick the model and the results. So you have two things that you want to load, the model and the results. So the model will be the BDF file, and the results will be the XDB file. Okay. Again, here's a graphical window. Uh, the features I use mostly in this one are these guys, and I'll talk a little bit about it. And I was more used to the older version. But I think I've been able to get around this newer version, so uh, hopefully it won't be too lost. But but it, it's actually, I think it's a little better interface, actually, than the old one. Okay, so first let's load the, the model. So this is the plate.bdf, which is in my Dropbox file. Let's see if I'm looking at plate one. Here's the plate, plate BDF file. 
And then by default, it'll load the results as the PDF file, but it won't show us any stresses, so we want to get the, the XDB file. This is actually it. Uh, for some reason, it's Windows, and it thinks it's an Exceed font database file. I don't know what that is, but it's an XDB file. So we'll open that up. And once you have them here, and this the same thing will work if you're using another code like Abacus, you'd use the .imp file, and then the ODB file as the results. If you're using LSDyna, you have the .k file for the model, and the D3 plot file as the results. Okay. When you get them, you just hit apply. And hopefully this will work. Reads the model, and here you go. Now here's the model, and you can, you know, go around and change the orientation, right? Like this is a pretty reasonable looking orientation. Scale in and out. You can do a window zoom, right? We can fit and pan and rotate. And all these are the same. You can also use the same mouse commands on the second mouse button as you would in Hyperview, okay? So that's kind of nice too. All right. All right, now over here, it's loaded the model, so you can see the uh, entities that are in the model. Um, just as it was created in Hyper Mesh, but now we also have um, some results. So it shows you the scalar results, tensor results, the vector results. So we have 2D forces, stresses and strains, the tensorial stresses and strains, SPC forces, and the element. Uh, the nodal displacements and rotations, okay? And now we have sets. I don't know what those are. I'm not sure exactly what those are. Okay. Um, if you have time dependency, you can animate it with this, but this is static, so there's no time dependency. Um, the first one I always like to look at is this sub-window here. Well, this, this allows you to shade the results. It, it, it basically lets you color whatever you want to see. So you can, we can look at the displacement. If you hit apply... This is the displacement contours for the solution, okay? And you can go through and edit these things and tinker around with them, put in more uh, levels and, and, and whatnot, okay? All right, we can look at the magnet, the different components, right? That's the X component. Very often what we're interested in looking at is, is the stress and the strain. So let's look at the stress. And again, you can plot the von Mises stress, the principal stresses. It'll actually even give you the sine Mises stress, the max shear, the stress intensity, and so on and so forth. So let's look at the Mises stress when you hit apply. And there you go. It gives the Mises stress. The other thing I like about this is it defaults and gives you the element stress. So it shows you the discontinuity and the stresses across the elements. Uh, you can average. So here's no averaging, so it's showing you the element results. We can go back and do a simple averaging, and you'll see this will basically do some simple nodal averaging, and there's more advanced ones. I honestly don't under, don't really know how those work out. I, I tend to not be a big fan of averaging, and I like to look at the, the actual element results. Again, remember, you know, this really is what's computed at the, at the quadrature points. And the other nice thing you can see here when you don't average is if you have a big jump, across the elements, for example, like in this region, it might give you some estimate on the error. So here we're jumping from about 2.4 times 10 to the fourth uh, megapascals down to about 1.5. So, you know, in this region, you'd expect to have errors at least on the order of that delta stress. So that gives you at least a little bound on the errors. Okay, I also have something weird going on in this window. I'm, I should probably check this. This should actually be the same as the far field. And of course, you can look at strain and all other things. We can look at the, uh, the element forces, right? So those are the actually membrane forces in the x direction. You can look at them in the y direction. You can look at the membrane forces in the shear. We can look at the bending forces. Now, there should be no bending forces in this problem. You can see they're all zero because there is no bending in this problem. But, but sometimes it's useful to actually see the, the nodal forces in the elements, okay? Uh, but let's not do that. Let's go back to the stress. Okay. Um, the, you can plot the deformed shape. Sometimes people like to see that. So this 
button here lets you plot the deformed shape on top of the undeformed shape. So let's try this. I think I there's plotting using the displacement to do the deformed shape. Now it's got a scaling factor. This is a very small displacement, so let's put a scale factor in here of a thousand. So you can see get deformed. That was a little too much. Let's do a hundred. So there's a hundred. And I can even show the undeformed shape, the edges, just to give a sense of how much is deformed. And you can see this is amplified by a thousand, but this shows you how it's deformed. And that, that seems reasonable, makes us feel that we, we at least got the boundary conditions relatively good. Um, the last one that I'll show, uh, so you can actually animate this. It's, it's kind of irrelevant, but it's just showing scaling from zero displacement to the max displacement, right? And this, this slider slows down the animation. That's still pretty fast. And you can make it go backwards and forwards and all sorts of other stuff. Okay? But anyway. There we go. Stop. Let's not do that anymore. <laughs> okay. Stop. Okay, the other one that's really useful here, although not so much in this plot, I'm trying to think of a good example of it, is this um, XY plot. So graph 2D. So very often we want to plot certain data. Um, I'm trying to think what would be a good example for a static problem. A lot of times this comes up in dynamic problems. We want to look at the stress over time. Uh, I'm thinking of, okay, well, actually, before I do that, let's say we wanted to make another a plot window where I actually want to make an XY plot of some data. Um, you can have multiple windows here. So if you look over here in this one, this allows you to, nope, not that one. This is the window layout. So if you click on this and pull it down, you can get two side by side. So let's, let's do that. Let's get two windows side by side. So now I have two windows. This one that I've already developed, and here's a new one. So let's make this new window be an XY plot. And to, to develop an XY plot, you can do other ones. You can do you know another, like I can make another plot here of, say, the um, pressure, right? You know, we can plot that. But let's say I also wanted to do some 2D plots. So that one's hypergraph, and here you go. Um, so it gives you just a default x, y axis. This is the most important one, I think. Well, usually we're doing x, y plots, but you can do other ones. I've never done any of these other ones. I've only done x, y plots. But this button here, whoops, what the hell happened? Can I go back to hyper? There we go. Oops, wait. There's another one. You gotta be careful because I was in the other window. I want to be in this one. And this is the build plot. So you have to, again, bring up the data file. So so you could actually use other types of data. You might want to use even experimental data, right? Didn't it like that? Why does it like that? Hmm. That's interesting. Huh. Well, it doesn't like this for some reason. Well, okay, I might have to give up on this one. Uh, but I've used this in dynamic things to look at load versus deflection and things like that. But in this problem, I think it's not doing me much good. For some reason, it doesn't like to read the XDB files for that string. Okay, well, whatever. Well, anyway, you can look at that if you want. I think it's actually pretty useful. Uh, you can even, you know, we've done other ones where you can actually load, say you did an experimental test on that, you could load the video of the test and Play them side by side. Um, I wonder if I have any good ones. Uh, and then the other nice thing is you can save. You can save the session files so you can revisit them another time. So let me just show you another example. Let's open a session. And I believe I should have some from another project that look kind of good.
these sections here. I'm not going to be set. Okay, I'm going to make these sections. Oh, okay, well, here's one. Okay, we can show you this one. Okay. This is actually results from Abacus, but it kind of goes the same way. You can get the idea. Except it stopped working and it's not happy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ah. Well, that's annoying. Let me do it again. I think it'll be good. I think we'll give it one try, and if he doesn't like it, then I'll just stop the video then. So let's go back. Let's open a new session. Let's go to session. Um, okay, which is under here. See, if I were professional, I would have made sure that I would have just stopped the video and gotten this to work correctly, but I'm too lazy to do that. doing something. Ah, oh, dang it. It does not like this. Wow, that's annoying. Okay. Well, this is really too bad. This actually shows... Uh, you can see it's grayed out here. I'll just discuss it and leave it, leave it at that. This one is actually a comparison. We, we did two simulations, one in LS Dyna and one in Abacus. And we take three different plates and they stretch over time. And... Um, Here's an example of the effect of stress in each one of these elements over time. You can see the plots. And we did the same thing for the LS Dyna model. It should plot up here. And you can actually compare the two. So it's quite, it's quite powerful. Okay. I think I can actually even show you the um, movies. So let's see if we can find the movies. I think I have some movies in here. Give you an example of what the type of stuff you can do. Right. So, for example, here's a poll test. This is an abacus. This is actually animating it. And I thought I had one where I actually had plots, but I guess I don't. I think I might have some good plots in here, even though I don't have the... Let's see here. I'm looking for a movie plot. Oh, here's one. Yeah. I was looking for some results that actually show the how you can get the, um, the movies to show up side by side, but it's not wanting to do this, so I'm going to stop here. But so I say you can do some really nice stuff with the post processing in here, and I think that's where I'll stop the video now. Okay.